we're asking you, it's a pretty blunt question, but it's a, it's a simple question to ask. Should the UK at this point suspend all arms exports to Israel? You might even want to go further, as some of the lawyers in this document um, have been talking about in some interviews already, that the UK needs to impose sanctions on Israeli politicians, particularly named Israeli politicians who have been saying things that are in the judgment of some an endorsement of genocide. 81771 for your text. Michael Mansfield KC is with us. Welcome back, Michael. And you're also a signatory of this um, letter, which is a very substantial um, document, 17 pages of legal arguments in there. Natasha Hausdorf is with us as well. Natasha is with UK Lawyers for Israel. Thank you both for joining us. Welcome, Natasha. Um, Michael, this is a very significant intervention. When people look through this document, they will see a lot of legal household names in there. But others might say, well, you know, lawyers take different views on different questions all the time. Uh, I could probably find you a thousand lawyers who disagree with you. What is the upshot of this letter? Well, uh, I'm not taking a poll on the law. So, I mean, you could find a lot of people who may, may disagree, of course. Uh, but the whole point is that the law is there as an arbiter. And the rule of law is extremely important. And as far as I'm concerned, this letter is uh, a reintroduction of the principles of international law. Now, this isn't the first letter. There was one sent last autumn after... Uh, the invade well uh, at the brink of an a land invasion uh, by Israel yeah. that had been prophesied. So this isn't the first one, and the object is uh, to persuade government to act within the rule of law. Uh, our government, because if you assist in international crime or potential international crime, then you're an accessory, and you are liable to find yourself. Uh, before the International Criminal Court, which is a different one from the International Court of Justice, uh, which is making a, a judgment. It hasn't yet arrived at it because, of course, it takes a long time to actually uh, finalise the judgment. But mm -hmm. if you waited for the final judgment, of course, the, the wrong which you're trying to deal with yeah. may have uh, been completed. So it may be obvious. That's um, what it's about. That's what it's about. Natasha, what do you make of this of this um, intervention by significant and senior lawyers? Well, it is extraordinary that this letter uh, relies on not just misstatements of international law, but also a misrepresentation of what it is that the International Court of Justice has held thus far. Uh, it's extraordinary that these sorts of errors can have been made by so many lawyers, uh, and I don't know how many of them actually read the order uh, that the International Court of Justice gave on the 26th of January, which is referred to in the letter. Unfortunately, the remainder of the letter also relies on Hamas propaganda, these unsubstantiated casualty figures, uh, and misstating the position on international aid. So the grave errors that have been made, I mean, I would certainly ask, were these errors that were made in good faith? In which case, please, could the signatories, uh, including my fellow panellists, walk that back with respect to the International Court of Justice in particular? Or is there something more sinister going on here? Because the fact of the matter is that international law is being played with in a fast and loose fashion. And this upending of the rule of law is certainly being sensationalised. It's certainly causing a great degree of fear and uncertainty. And you have referenced the civil servants who have raised their own concerns. But all of this is being uh, predicated upon uh, gross misinformation and the public is being desperately misinformed uh, by these falsehoods, uh, which Natasha, unfortunately I... serve one particular purpose. The only purpose, and I'll finish on this point... Oh, no, I don't want you to finish. To... I, I want to hear from, more from you, but I'm, I'm only interrupting to... Uh, you said mis misstatements of the law, yes. misrepresentations and propaganda. Can you give us... So let's just, just start with a clean, clear example of a misrepresentation or mistaken statement of international law in the document. 
Certainly. The first of these that I can give an example of is set out clearly in a letter that has been sent to the Prime Minister this morning that has already been signed by several hundred lawyers. And it relates to uh, this assertion that the letter puts forward that the International Court of Justice found a plausible risk of genocide in Gaza. One only needs to look at paragraph 54 of the court's order of the 26th of January to understand that the court said nothing of the sort. Uh, the court determined that the plausibility concerned the rights claimed by South Africa and whether or not they fell under the convention. That was the basis upon which the preliminary measures that the court ordered were made. And those preliminary measures, in fact, restated the existing position under international law. That is one of the reasons the Ugandan uh, judge who uh, dissented, Judge Sebutinde called the provisional measures uh, on that occasion redundant. Those that have been subsequently ordered similarly restate Israel's existing obligations under international law. All of those obligations, Israel has been clear that it has complied with. And so this letter not only misstates what the International Court of Justice found, but uses that as a basis uh, for the further misrepresentations as to the position uh, with respect to the latest order um, in terms of provisional measures that the court has given uh, on international aid. Now, that is a matter of public record that Israel has been facilitating uh, throughout the transfer of international aid to the Gaza Strip. It is also clear that its capacity to inspect aid as part of that facilitation process far outstrips uh, the international aid that is being transferred in, and certainly that there is a backlog once mm -hmm. that aid has been inspected by Israel because it is not able to be distributed appropriately by by the on-the-ground international organisations, right. NGOs, UN organisations. A big part of the problem there is because many of these have been infiltrated by Hamas because Hamas has been stealing this aid away from the civilians that are in dire need of it. And if these international lawyers, well, most of them, I have to say, are not international lawyers who've signed on to this letter, as far as I can see, but if these lawyers really had concern for the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, they would be calling on the international community to do more to ensure that aid is properly distributed, even distributed to Palestinian civilians evacuated into uh, the south, uh, through the south of uh, Gaza into Egypt, where they can be properly cared for, and indeed calling for the end to Hamas terror, oppression, suppression of the Palestinian people. All this letter does, all these calls for a ceasefire do, is strengthen Hamas and prolong the suffering of both Palestinians and Israelis. So let me just um, read one sentence. I think it's the one that you're referencing, Natasha, from this letter from former judges and, and lawyers to the UK government. It says and in, in its summary, and I'm reading from section one of the letter dealing with the provisional order of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, uh, that the court concluded that, and I quote, South Africa's claims, and this is a, court, a quote from the court, that South Africa's claims with respect to the right of the Palestinians in Gaza to be protected from acts of genocide and related prohibited acts identified in Article 3 of the Genocide Convention were plausible. Now, that's that's from the document that the lawyers have signed. Uh, Michael, you're one of those lawyers who have signed this document. Natasha is essentially arguing that you're misstating what the, the court has found by saying that there is a plausible risk of genocide uh, that has been... Um, identified rather that South Africa's concerns are plausible. That's what the court has found. And well, forgive me. The, Sorry, the did I misstate that? that the rights, no, no, that, that's quite right. That the the letter incorrectly references plausible risk, okay. and this much was called out also by Joshua Rosenberg, the preeminent legal journalist. But the uh, court has okay. in fact considered whether those plausible rights claimed no, by no, South I, Africa. I don't want you to go through it all again. I, I was just trying to just. Bullet point it for our well, audience, not for Michael. He doesn't need my help, as you can be sure. Nor do no you, Natasha. Nor well, do you, Natasha. Uh, Michael, what do you say to that? Michael, Ma convention. let's get Michael's response now, please. Michael. Well, I'm pausing just to wait and see if there's any more to come. Uh, because I don't want there to be interruptions of any kind. Now, you, you will note that the, the language and the tenor of what I have to say uh, it, it's not in the same league of what you've just heard. I'm not making suggestions about anybody who's got criticisms of this letter whatsoever. This, this letter uh, pinpoints, uh, and if I dare say this will be contested as well, the United Nations Security Council, I'll come back to the letter in one second, has very recently and unusually called for a ceasefire, unless it's going to be argued 
that no, they didn't. Uh, they were calling for something else. But it seemed to me that it was a fairly obvious call. Uh, there's been a question over whether it's binding. I would argue that it is a, bind, a matter of binding law. And uh, on this topic, before again returning to the letter in a second, which I will do, and obviously I reject utterly that this is propaganda, that any of us have been minded to put forward on as propaganda. So I, I think that's a rather, uh, well, let's put it mildly, an unfair uh, allegation. However, uh, Israel as a country has, in uh, my contention, uh, this is not in the letter, it, 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 ignored consistently the proclamations of international law. The leading case on this, 2004, called the war, where the advisory opinion of the same court was sought and was delivered, has been ignored by Israel for all sorts of political reasons. So we're dealing with a state which I would submit has no respect for international law, not the lawyers who signed this letter. Now, the point about the International Court on this occasion, and there have been two occasions this year, the first one referenced in the letter was on the 16th of February, uh, 2024, and we've put in the letter words from the judgment. The most, and I'll come back to plausible in a minute, the most recent developments in the Gaza Strip, and in Rafa in particular, would, in quotes, exponentially increase what is already a humanitarian nightmare. We have to face the reality here that this is all being done in the name of self-defense, uh, which my friend must realize has its limits within international law. Unless, of course, we're going to say international law is now irrelevant and people can do what they want. It's a humanitarian nightmare with untold regional consequences. Further, it observed that this perilous situation, this is in February, demands immediate and effective implementation of the provisional measures. And the same urgency must apply and so on to the, Gen uh, the Genocide Convention. Now, on the 28th of March, the same court issued a further order, not because they felt that uh, you know, Israel was complying, but because the conditions had got worse, and it's perfectly obvious they're getting worse by the day. It noted, these are words from the court, the catastrophic humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. Of course, if you want to deny that's happening, well, then you may be on another planet, which existed when it issued its order of January, has deteriorated, this is on the 28th of March, even further with unprecedented levels of food insecurity experienced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip over the recent weeks, as well as the increasing risk of epidemics. And of course, uh, it goes on to say, the court indicated two further provisional measures emphasize the need for the unhindered provision at scale of humanitarian assistance, three of whom, uh, seven of whom were shot dead the other day uh, sorry, I say shot dead. We, we, as far as we know, it was drones, in fact, uh, uh, who were, had been helping with the provision at scale. So the situation on the ground, everybody agrees, is catastrophic. Who's occupying the position on the ground? Israel is the occupying force. And are the Israelis saying, well, in order to complete what we call self-defense emanating from October the 7th, we are entitled to annihilate everybody who stands in their way. 35,000 people, mostly, mostly women and children. And the latest reports indicating that babies and infants have been shot by snipers in the head, a report that was uh, has been made public within the last few days. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that's going on. Now, you can't go to the court in the first place and just argue anything you want. Uh, and the main contention that the South African delegation made, and of course they've been accused of being, you know, members of Hamas almost. I mean, it's quite ridiculous. People who get upset about all of this are saying actually, you know, uh, I think outrageous uh, 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 allegations are being made. So even the South African uh, uh, lawyers who are proposing this, you, they went to the court in order to, if the case is about genocide, it hasn't been decided, that it has, can't be decided at this juncture. But there are provisional measures that they can make, not just out of the blue, in the context of genocide, 
They're not going to make these provisional measures if there's no prospect of genocide and it's not plausible. The mm, whole right. basis, the foundation of the application to the court is that, it, that at this stage, it doesn't have to be proved, but it has there has to cross a threshold in which you're able to establish to the court's satisfaction of that threshold okay. that there is a plausible case. That's why it comes in in that way. So I don't accept anything that is being said on this. Uh, and obviously, I haven't consulted any of the other <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, writers uh, uh, whose signatories. Uh, what I'm saying, I, I make clear, is in a personal capacity. No one should envy my um, my role here to try to give um, uh, the odd bullet-pointed summary of what people are saying, given that you've got legal minds at work. But, Natasha, what I take from that is there, it does not make sense for the International Court of Justice to agree provisional me measures if there isn't a risk of genocide, those provisional me measures having been handed down in respect of the Genocide Convention. So the, the court has determined there's a risk and that Israel has to do everything humanly possible to mitigate that risk, to reduce the possibility of any genocide developing. Is that a fair summary of what the court has said? Uh, it is not. And simply put, if that had been the case, the court would have said as much. I'm very glad that Michael Mansfield is now reading through some of the text of the orders of the court. I wish that had been conducted before this letter uh, was com uh, compiled and indeed signed, because the words plausible risk are not contained uh, within uh, the, the, the orders. And in fact, the operative paragraph of the order, the 26th of January, paragraph 54, was quoted uh, in the letter that we are discussing. And that was why I think, um, uncharacteristically, Joshua Rosenberg was prompted to write uh, how extraordinary it was that indeed several retired judges uh, had signed on to this and his hope had been expressed that they, uh, in fact, read the judgments that they are asked to sign on to more closely than the material uh, supporting this letter. It is absolutely incorrect to say that Security Council Resolution 2728 is legally binding. That is a matter of basic international law under the Charter of the United Nations. Only those resolutions under the Security Council that are made under Chapter 7 have uh, binding effect are in fact legal. Other resolutions, uh, as anyone who uh, has done a, a, even a basic university course in international law should know, uh, are essentially political resolutions. And that is what we saw uh, in terms of the game playing, unfortunately, given that there are so many lives at stake in the Se uh, Security Council with vetoes going backwards and forwards. Uh, the fact of the matter is that all this letter has done in misstating both what the International Court of Justice has said, but also what the situation on the ground is, uh, is move this debate um, so that so many people who perhaps don't have a background in international law, uh, aren't practicing, uh, practitioners, um, are encouraged to take at face value uh, what is being said against Israel. Uh, in many respects, uh, what is being said by those who have a long track record of vilifying Israel and abusing international law. This is a, a recognised concept now of lawfare, especially against the Jewish state, but I don't anticipate it will end with Israel. This is a phenomenon which all law-abiding states uh, should take very, very seriously because the politicisation of international legal institutions, supported as it is in this context uh, by lawyers who really ought to know better, has potentially dire consequences for all of us that actually care about the rule of law. Okay. This letter and these misrepresentations only serve to support Hamas and, as I said earlier, to extend uh, this unfortunate situation. Okay. Well, and we have seen the effects of it, Natasha, me, in terms of the political statements. I just, yes. want, I just want to pause on this point about whether the UN Security Council resolution is legally binding, this particular resolution. Well, the United States No, has, no, has Natasha, been just one second, please. We're talking about mm -hmm. resolution 2728, yes. it, and we want to, let's just pause on that question. That's, Natasha, no, please, just binding. let's just pause for a second on that question, because I've done a number of programmes on this question, and it's fair to say that we've had different people arguing in different ways about whether this is legally binding. We've had some say that only United Nations Security Council resolutions are binding, that General Assembly's statements are not binding. We've had some say that every UN Security Council is binding, 
by definition. And we have others, yourself included, who say only those resolutions adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter are binding. That's the Charter uh, that deals with threats to peace, breaches of peace, acts of aggression and, and the like. Aoife, where do you stand on that? Uh, well, it's it's actually quite clear. The International Court of Justice, the court that we're talking about in an earlier decision in Namibia, said that all Security Council resolutions are binding. Chapter 7 is only with regard to the use of force. Um, on, and that is why this resolution isn't adopted under Chapter 7, because it's not actually relevant to the, the contents. So it, it is binding. Um, every single Security Council member said it was binding are the United States. So, and we're very clear that they f- they were vi- voting. If the United States didn't think it was binding, it would have, uh, or you know, felt otherwise. They certainly didn't raise that issue before va- voting in favour of it. So it is every. Uh, I, I noticed you know the reference to the United States, but in fact yeah. they are the lone voice okay. on well, the Security let, Council. And again, Natasha, let, you've mentioned Article Seven of the UN Charter. Article Twenty Five, I'll quote, says of the UN Charter, the members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present Charter. Now, that has been suggested to me as a clear legal text in the UN Charter, which makes every resolution binding. What do you say to that particular interpretation? Uh, That is seeking to circumvent uh, the effect of uh, clear... um, provisions within the UN Charter by the back door. Uh, It's right that um, the International Court of Justice has sought to expand the concept of Article um, of, of, of Chapter Seven resolutions to include those resolutions under Chapter Six that use particular language, uh, what it called this is decides language. Uh, that is pretty controversial in and of itself. But what is not controversial when one looks at the text of this resolution is that that language doesn't appear at all, other than deciding to remain seized with the matter. Mm-hmm. So I'm afraid that 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 uh, those legal acrobatics uh, get us no further. And John Kirby was the was absolutely correct. This was a National Security Council spokesman when he said after the passing of that resolution, he didn't understand why Israel uh, was so bothered by it because it was not binding. Well, let me explain to you uh, why it is uh, that Israel was so bothered by America's refusal to veto that resolution. And in fact, a meeting that had been scheduled for later that week uh, between Sahel Hanegbi uh, and uh, Ron Derma did not take place in Washington because despite the fact that this resolution has no legal effect, the political messaging of it, and in particular, given that it was yeah. a resolution separated the release of hostages from an immediate ceasefire was unacceptable. And this, in fact, goes uh, to, to very, very uh, directly to the issues that I think we're seeing with this letter, okay. because the legal impact of them, of, of what is being said, uh, is 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 incorrect, as I've already explained, um, but not that significant. But the, the real problem here is the uh, misinformation is generating a political firestorm, which is only serving the interests of this internationally prescribed terrorist organisation, Hamas, uh, which is an Iranian proxy, of course. OK, now I just want to give Aoife a final word. Michael Mansfield has gone, but Aoife uh, O'Donoghue, who's a law professor at Queen's University, one of the signatories of this document that Natasha uh, is commenting on here. If Natasha's interpretation is correct... Mm-hmm then this document, which is signed by former Supreme Court justices, professors of law, some very significant legal figures across the country, has engaged in some of the most rudimentary pedestrian errors. Uh, You've misunderstood what is a legally binding UN Resolution Council, which is International Law 101, and you have misstated misrepresented the very findings of the International Court of Justice upon which your document itself rests. Well, I think you characterised it perfectly at the very start when you said it read like a legal document and it was composed like a legal document. I would also say, like Michael Mansfield, I'm I'm not speaking for the whole group. I'm speaking on my own behalf. But it was very carefully. So, for instance, the evidence based is uh, used in it is very clear. It's all UN evidence. It's the UN Special Rapporteur on Food. It's the UN Food Security. It's the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights. Very carefully choosing where we get our factual basis on which to build a legal argument. On the the slow building up of the very clear legal arguments that are there, 
using relying on the text of the charter on the ICJ judgment in particular and that idea that the, because the ICJ in fact could never have made any of its provisional measures without first finding plausibility. It actually couldn't have told Israel to do anything unless it found that there was a plausible case from South Africa. Everything else after that flows from that that singular, singular determination and that is at the core of what this letter right. is saying. Thank you both very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, Aoife O'Donoghue and Natasha Hausdorff.